Welcome to Building Health, One Layer at a Time, with host Kathy Moore, Health Officer and Public Health Director of Muskegon County, and special guest, Christina Parks, PhD, Cellular and Molecular Biology. Building Health, One Layer at a Time is presented by Public Health of Muskegon County. Hi, welcome to Building Health. I am Kathy Moore, Health Director and Health Officer for the County of Muskegon. We are bringing you a show um, and we hope to have a series of shows um, to outreach and help educational series that you, our residents, can learn, engage, and um, apply to your everyday health. We are calling this series Building Health, and we have a special guest who's bringing our expertise, and she will be our co-host um, with all these shows, Christina Parks. Hi, Christina. Hi, good afternoon. Um, uh, this show, the beginning of the show, we're going to start with an introduction. So I'd like you to just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Before we launch in the content, you probably are wondering who is this person and um, what does she have to do with building health? So my name is Dr. Christina Parks. I am not a medical doctor. I am actually um, a biomedical researcher, or I used to be. And so I got my PhD from University of Michigan in 1999. And my focus was on cytokine signaling, which probably means nothing to you. But what I really wanted to know was what turns our genes on and off? And that's what we were really looking at. And we've made huge strides in the last um, 30 years and Absolutely. even in the last you know, 10 to 20 years. And recently, because there's so much information online, mm -hmm. I've been able to actually do even more research awesome. online that we didn't used to be able to have that capability. So um, I would like to bring that expertise of understanding how our genes work to actually, you know, how can we build health? How can we become healthier people, have healthier lives? Great. Um, looking back, what were some of the most important you think, things you learned during your research? Well, one of the things most important that I learned is that research is like 40 years ahead mm -hmm. of what we're actually doing, um, sometimes in the doctor's office. If, and they, like if you go somewhere like Mayo Clinic, um, they may only be 10 to 20 years behind the research, mm -hmm. but there's very few places that actually are implementing what we know in order to actually help us with our health. And it takes so much time to trickle down. And I thought, really, it's, you know, research is amazing, but what we really need is to get this information into the hands of people. And so at that point, I decided really my heart was for education. Mm -hmm. um, I had been working in the Ypsilanti Public Schools while I was in graduate school, and I saw um, how little that education of what I knew had been brought down. And so I actually decided at that point I wanted to be a teacher, and I actually, um, left biomedical research uh -huh. and got my teaching degree awesome. and I taught actually locally in, in Mona Shores and Muskegon Heights and in Hesperia Public Schools as a, a biology and a chemistry teacher. So um, that kind of bio, um, science education is really my passion. Awesome. I, I think one of the things I'm most excited about is that, like you said, there's so much information and knowledge out there. How do we take that information and bring it to our public so that they may p apply it and use it because again 40 years and we're we're just learning about some of these new things right and if you were to go look at a research paper um you could bring it up online and it might as well be written in latin or french or german mm -hmm. or something because you'd be like i don't know what this is saying so it takes a lot of context to understand what this new development in research is saying. Yes. And so that's why having people who are science educators is really, really important to distill it down and tell you, what's the take home? What do I need to know for my life? How does this apply to me? Awesome. So, so glad you are joining us. So glad that you will be our co-host. And um, you've titled the first unit, The Wisdom of Our Ancestors. What does that have to do with building health? So. Um, we sometimes we get so involved in progress and biomedical research that we're focusing always in the future and we 
tend to think that like maybe we were smarter than our ancestors, uh -huh. than our grandmother, and most of us who've had grandmothers who slapped us a couple times know that mm -hmm. no, we really, we really aren't. Mm -hmm. And what they're actually finding now, the biomedical research is really validating that some of these things that the wisdom of our ancestors and what they ate and what they did and many of the ways that they lived their lives, there was actually a lot of value in that. And they we're coming full circle to find out that going out and getting some fresh air and some sunlight and eating eating your, your vegetables is actually, there's a lot of scientific data behind um, why these things are good for you and some of the things that we've been told. And not only that, it gets even more specific into how the foods were prepared. So some of us have heard that um, it's kind of a, a tale where someone says, you know, the woman's making a roast and she cuts off the end of the pot roast and then she's going to put it in the oven and her husband says, well, why do you always do that? And she mm -hmm. says, I don't know, because my mother did it, right? Right, right. So we learned these habits. Yes. And in that case, she asked her mother, and her mother said, well, because the pan was too small. Oh, <laughs> so wow. So sometimes there's not a yes. good reason, yes. but sometimes there are there really is. good reasons. Yes. And so what were the really good reasons that our ancestors prepared foods mm -hmm. in the way that they did? And some native cultures around the world still prepare foods in these ways, and some of them are actually getting away from that. And they're going to lose, there are some really real health benefits we're finding out to preparing foods mm -hmm. in specific ways. And we're going to lose those health benefits if we think that everything new and progressive and modern is, is better. automatically better. That's true. Right. So you're, you're saying that the diets of our ancestors are better than our modern diets. And how did, how did you come up with that? So I didn't come up with it at all. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I had kind of a paradigm shifting event. I was having some health problems. And so being a researcher, I was constantly looking for new information. And in some of the books that I was reading over and over again, I kept seeing a reference to this book and it wasn't available in my library. It's called Nourishing oh. Traditions. Mm -hmm. And they kept referencing it. And I thought, well, you know, being a researcher, you got to go to the source. And so I got this book, Nourishing Traditions, and it's a fabulous book, and we'll be talking more about it. And it really has a lot of information about how our ancestors prepared foods, nourishing traditions, yes. right? Yes. But what I found that led me to was this book. And this book is called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price. And um, what this was is a book written by a dentist. So Weston A. Price practiced dentistry in like the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And what he found in America was that um, his clients had a lot of cavities. They had a lot of deformations in their um, jaw structures. And he knew that it was probably malnutrition. Mm -hmm. And he said, we're such a rich country. Why are we seeing this level of malnutrition? Now, this was before we started supplementing the food okay. even. And so he thought, you know, I wonder if there are people groups out there somewhere that actually have um, more traditional diets. And I wonder if they're healthier. Mm. Um, because really, I'm thinking that it's our standard American diet, even way back then, mm -hmm. that is not really giving us the health that we need. So what he did is he actually went around the world wow. to all these different cultures. Wow. And he looked for cultures, um, people groups that were sort of separated from um, the trade, right? Mm -hmm. Because like trade, there was a lot of white sugar, white flour mm -hmm. coming in these trade routes. And so he wanted people that were really still doing their traditional, sure. living in their traditional ways and eating their traditional foods. Mm -hmm. But the cultures um, were very different. We had Scottish people, Alpine people, African Maasai, New England Maori, the Alaskan Inuit. So there were many, the Australian Aborigines. Wow. So, I mean, yes. he like hit the gamut. All like over. it wasn't just, yes. yeah, one people group. And so as he looked at these, um, in, um, these indigenous people groups eating their native diets, he found something that was just jaw-dropping, that they had just amazing health. Wow. Okay. Yes. He found that they had sunny, easygoing dispositions. Their babies never cried. So how many of us want babies who never cried? Amazing. So a well-nourished yes. baby is going to be happy and healthy. Much. Yeah, they're going to look around. And we've seen babies who do that. They're just always mm -hmm. taking it in, taking it in. Um, they had extremely high intelligence. They had excellent eyesight and hearing. They had strength and health mm -hmm. into old age. In fact, one Alpine woman would take the 100-pound bag of rye and walk up the Alps with it. She was, uh, you know, 80 yes. years old, wow. and she was still able to carry awesome. that kind of weight-bearing exercise um, because these people were very, very, very healthy into old age. And so they had few to no cavities. In fact, in one, again, this was in the, in the Alps, the Swiss Alps, um, he went there and it was like 
50 degrees. Him and his wife were wearing jackets. It was chilly. The mm -hmm. kids were all playing in the stream, uh -huh. getting wet. And he thought, oh, it just makes me cold thinking about it. And, uh, and so they were doing fine. They were so healthy. And then he went to look at their teeth. Well, their teeth were covered with green slime. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't like the height of dental hygiene here. Uh -huh. So they brushed off the green slime and these children still had no cavities. Amazing. Wow. Okay. So wow. he thought this isn't just a hygiene issue. This is a diet issue. And so as I read these things, that it really just transformed my way of thinking. So um, the women had broad hips and easy childbirth, which I mean, who doesn't want that? Mm -hmm. And at that time, and many times there was rampant tuberculosis, which we now know um, can be predisposed by a vitamin D deficiency. Yes. And so um, these cultures were not, these um, people groups on their native diet were not affected by that. Their children had few to no birth defects, and he didn't see any of the chronic diseases of, um, of uh, civilization, cancer and, and tuberculosis and heart disease and um, some of these things that we are so rampant right now. And so he thought, what in the world is so different about their diets? And I think what's so interesting is these are groups all over the world. Right. So they're eating their own native diets. So their native diets, they had to be different diets for each native group. Right, so let me tell you about how different some of these diets are. I think okay. this is so fascinating and I tried to get uh, you know, into some of these different ways of eating, but like it's so different, you mm -hmm. get so used to what you grow up on. Yes. So the Scottish, um, these are people out in the Outer Hebrides, which are some islands, and it was like gloomy all the time, but these people had sunny, easygoing dispositions. Like I get seasonal affective disorder, uh -huh. and I would get really gloomy, but these people were still bright and chipper, and their diet was mostly oats. It was the only thing that grew on the island, and in fact, they, they heated with peat, they burned peat, and then all of the smoke went up into the, um, they actually used like the peat to line their roofs. And then they took that peat oh, and wow. buried it. The oats grew up and that's the only way they could even get oats to grow on these barren oh, islands. So they ate oats and they ate fish because they were fisher people. Mm -hmm. And what one of their favorite things to give their kids to make them healthy and strong, kind of like the Popeye thing, was they would take fish heads and chop the fish cod livers up and mix them with the oats and put that in the fish heads and cook them and that would be a nutritious breakfast. Interesting. Yeah, so I don't think I could get my kids to sign on for that, nope. um, but it's certainly interesting. So the Swiss, Swiss Alpine was mostly um, ate dark rye bread mm -hmm. and uh, cheese, right? Raw um, cheese from the milk from these cows. Okay. And they didn't have a very varied diet, so how do they manage to be so healthy on it? Yes. The African Maasai had a less varied diet. They were shepherds and they would bleed their animals. They were excellent veterinarians. Mm -hmm. And um, so they knew how to bleed them without hurting them. So they would also, the, the females they would get milk from and the males they would bleed. And they actually, that's all they ate was blood and milk. And a Maasai warrior might drink up to three liters of milk a day. Wow. And, but they never had the milk and the um, blood together because I think that there's things in the milk that will prevent you from absorbing the iron in the blood. And they would actually, there's fibrin in your blood, that's what makes it clot. They would mm -hmm. take all of that and then roast it and have like their little roasted barbecue. Okay, I cannot imagine that, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. So just, this is just giving you an idea, yes, like very absolutely. different. Like I can imagine eating um, rye bread and cheese. I, right. I would be good with that. So but like, all know. of these diets were very different, yet they all promoted health. How, how is yeah. that? Why is that? So let me, I'm going to go two more, okay, two more diets sure. because I think these are so fascinating. The New, New uh, Zealand Maori ate um, many different foods. It was like a paradise. They had pork and taro and seafood and veggies and fruit. So we could see where they would get enough. Mm -hmm. And the Alaskan Inuit, um, basically, there's no vegetables. There's no oh, fruit here, oh, right? Okay. So what are they eating? They're eating whale blubber okay. and fish. And they actually, you know, you had to keep your food. And so they, they decided to put their food in a pit to keep it and it fermented. And so they fed that fish at first to the dogs. Oh, And yeah. they found when they fed that fermented fish to the sled dogs, they could run all day. And they just had excellent stamina and they just like never yes. gave up. Yes. And so they thought, well, maybe we should try this. And I'd be like, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but they tried it and mm -hmm. they found they had the same stamina. Wow. So some of them said, yeah, I don't really prefer this food, but I know that if I'm gonna this go hunting for a day or two, I'm gonna have all the stamina I need. So again, back to your question. So all of these are so diverse, completely different diets. Yes. What in the world do they have in common? Yes. And so that's um, 
the things that we're going to do this whole series on. Okay. And so let's go, we're just going to kind of give an overview right now, mm -hmm. and then we're going to go into each, some of these things a lot more specifically Great. with each different segment. Awesome. So one of the things they had in common were organ meats. So mm -hmm. how many of you at home are eating organ meats? No, right? right? How many of like your ancestors ate organ meats? Probably all of them. Mm -hmm. um, I know that my husband's father ate liver and onions. Yes. It was very typical to have liver and onions at mm -hmm. least once a week. And so liver is extremely high in vitamins A and D. And many of these organ meats have specific nutrients that our bodies need. In fact, when we first brought like uh, the big cats, like lions and tigers into mm -hmm. the zoos, mm -hmm. they really had trouble getting them to reproduce and they couldn't figure out what the problem was. They were well fed, they were cared for, mm -hmm. they just couldn't support a pregnancy. And so they went into the wild and they watched these um, big cats. And what they found is that often, the big cat would kill a deer or gazelle or whatever, mm -hmm. and it would only eat the organs. Interesting. So those, they knew what uh, nutrients they were deficient in and what organs intuitively mm -hmm. had that. And when they started feeding these cats organ meats, they were able That's to reproduce. Fine. Okay, yeah. so as an example, the adrenal glands have vitamin C. So where are you getting your um, vitamin C if you live in Alaska at the North Pole? Oh yeah, they're not eating oranges or grapefruits, are they? No. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe now, right? <laughs> right. Um, and what they found is your green, adrenal glands of animals make vitamin C. And so they would take the adrenal glands and they would chop them up and make sure everybody got a little piece of adrenal gland. So like for Christmas, instead oh. of like your... You know, <laughs> So your little jelly beans. Case, you hang adrenal glands. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So everybody would get some vitamin C. Um, they knew that eyes provided vitamin A. Of course, they didn't call them these different vitamins. Mm -hmm. And there's some stories like there was this guy that was um, trekking, you know, an American trekking through the Canadian Rockies, and he lost his sight due to vitamin A deficiency. Of course, he didn't realize what it Why? was, and he couldn't really go anywhere. He was stuck. Well, he was about to starve to death, and a native person found him, mm -hmm. killed an animal, gave him the eyes, made him eat him. He probably didn't even know what, what he, he was, was doing, yeah. right? And, uh, and he regained his vision because retinol, uh -huh. right, our retina, retinol, is vitamin A. It's true vitamin A, and so our eyes are very high in vitamin A. So like. A lot of times when you cook a fish head, that vitamin A comes out into the solution. So when you have soup from fish heads, mm -hmm. which is how people would traditionally make soup, yes. you're getting high vitamin A. Interesting. And that, if you've seen the movie The Life of Pi, mm -hmm. um, there's yes. like a little episode there where he loses his sight and then has to eat, eat like fish eyes in order to get it back. So, so how and why uh, do you think the modern or westernized diet uh, became so uh, deficient in these vitamins? So um, one of the reasons is what, because we don't um, eat fat anymore, right? We've demonized fat mm -hmm. and we said take that, take that skin off your chicken, yes. cut all the fat off. Vitamins A and D are fat soluble and so they're really, really needed. And vitamin K comes only almost from butter and most of us don't even eat butter anymore. For many people, it's kind of expensive, and we've been told it's bad for us. Right. Um, and when, like, margarine and butter kind of compete at the mm -hmm. grocery store, mm -hmm. so do you think the food manufacturers really want you to know how nutritious butter is for you? So they've kind of demonized it, and wow. it's really a nutritional powerhouse in so many ways, which makes sense, because where does it come from? It comes from the cream that that mama cow yes. is giving her baby, right? right? Mama cows, mamas are gonna give their baby the best. Absolutely. And so it's gonna be very, very high in nutrients. And so that's interesting because many of the foods, and we're gonna talk about that in the next segment, mm -hmm. that have this high vitamin content are for babies. Eggs, right, mm -hmm. are for babies, mm -hmm. right? You've got your um, milk is for babies. And, and sometimes fish eggs, like roe, is ba you know, for babies as well. I didn't know about that part. Fish eggs? I mean, fish eggs? Yeah, they're very high in For vitamin. babies? Well, I mean, the, the, I'm saying what, what they, they're making, like the fish egg has all the nutrients to make a baby fish. Oh. Right? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Right. So, yes. yeah, yeah. And so, Thank like, you. and then chicken eggs, it's making a baby chicken. Absolutely. So it has to be really, really high in nutrients yes. to make that baby chicken. That makes sense. And so all eggs are going to be really high That's in true. nutrients. Right. And so we were talking about what those diets had in common. One was organ meats, where we have a variety of these um, different vitamins. Um, the next is bone broths. Mm -hmm. So bone broths, our bones are really um, nutrient-dense in minerals. 
and things like calcium and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't necessarily always get that. And sometimes our soils are mineral deficient. But if we, when, and how many of us actually make bone broth? Well, when you make broth the old-fashioned way, where you take a carcass, a chicken carcass, and you, and you cook it, it. Uh -huh. those minerals actually come out of the bones. Okay. All right? right? And so we, one of the reasons we're deficient in minerals is because we get this can of Swanson's. We do. And yes. I don't think they're probably making it the same way. I don't way. think so. Yeah. And so the next is um, raw dairy. Um, one of the things with dairy, when we went to pasteurizing it, is that killed the vitamin D in it. It broke it down, and so they actually add back synthetic. So you are getting some, oh, but it's not the natural vitamin D that would be there. And the thing is, like, pasteurized milk actually goes bad faster than raw milk mm -hmm. because raw milk actually has a bunch of antimicrobial probiotics really? in it. And that's something we never appreciated in the past is that milk was actually a huge probiotic. And that's, we make yogurt out of it, mm -hmm. right? But we have to add back new bacteria to make yogurt because the milk is pasteurized. Already. They wow. never used to do that. Sour cream, you just put that cream on the stove, mm -hmm. it went sour, it naturally fermented. Wow. Because the natural bacteria keep it from going bad, they turn it into yogurt and sour cream and things. Mm -hmm. And um, so that brings us to almost all of their foods were fermented. That was a way to preserve it. And we thought, well, it's just a way to preserve it, no big deal. But now we're finding out that fermented foods have a ton of benefits. And we're going to do a whole show to talk about fermented foods awesome. and the probiotic benefit of that. Mm -hmm. And there's many other benefits as well. So you talked about butter, you talked about fat content, and like you said, our modern world, they, they basically, um, they make us think, and, and maybe this is through marketing, that fat is bad for us. So, so does fat make you fat? <laughs> no, in fact, um, that's kind of a misnomer. Okay. And um, there are certain kinds of fats, and obviously at my age, um, I don't need to eat fat all day, mm -hmm. right? I've got mm -hmm. plenty on me mm -hmm. <laughs> to keep me going. And I have some extra but, food. And so food this taste. is not like an advertisement to just go eat as much fat as you want. Yes. But what we know now is it's actually sugar makes you fat. So we mm -hmm. went on this whole fat-free cra craze. Uh -huh. And what we know now is that when you eat sugar, it increases your insulin. And what does insulin do? It tells sugar to go into your cells and turn into fat. Okay. And so when you eat sugar, it all goes into your cells and creates fat. And what happens when it goes into your cells? You feel lightheaded. You go, oh, I feel lightheaded. I need to eat something. Let me make a pot roast. No, you grab another cookie, mm -hmm. another donut, yep. and the circle goes over and over again. Very Many people in the African-American community, including myself, I've been pre-diabetic my whole life mm -hmm. because as soon as I eat any um, uh, processed carbohydrates like a donut or something, mm -hmm. my blood sugar spikes, my insulin takes all that sugar, puts it into my cells, and then I have low blood sugar. I feel terrible, so I eat so, a carbohydrate yes. and it goes circle, circle, wow. circle. And so that feeds a cycle that ends up creating people to become diabetics. Wow. And so one way we know to break that cycle, if you have a genetic, epigenetic predisposition to mm -hmm. become diabetic, is to stop eating those processed carbohydrates right, to, mm -hmm. to eat the proteins and yes. the fats. Yes. And so we know now that it's actually a high sugar, high carbohydrate diet that really feeds that um, making, making unhealthy fat in your body. Right. Well, so how can a person's diet affect their children and their child's teeth um, or, or bones or how does so, that work? So yeah, we tend to think that, that like we're just kind of set and, and there's just nothing that we can do. Mm -hmm. Where um, in um, ancient cultures, they spent a lot of time and energy. In fact, many cultures spent up to three years on making sure that young women, before they got married, mm -hmm. had all the nutrients they want. Some would travel hundreds of miles to uh -huh. get things like fish eggs so that they really? had that vitamin D. Yes. If they didn't have like, um, like one of the big sources of vitamin D would be like milk. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have that, they would travel to the ocean to get fish eggs. And, um, and also to get other aquatic, um, like um, um, seaweed that had iodine, because iodine is very important for mm -hmm. reproduction. And so really making those strong, healthy children was a priority. Now we sort of take it for granted. It's like after you get pregnant, someone says, oh, maybe I should take a prenatal, yeah, prenatal vitamin. vitamins. Right. Yeah, and sometimes that's after conception. Right. There's so much happening in terms of development before conception and that you, those vitamins A and D are so important in. And so um, what Weston A. Price found is after he figured out um, that these diets were so much more nutrient dense, he actually went and um, he uh, 
had a school and he fed them a high vitamin diet. Mm -hmm. And what he found is that some of the kids who were the worst, one of the kids that was the absolute, like not doing well in the class, became the top student. Wow. So it's not just, you know, at conception, mm -hmm. it's like at any point, your vitamin status can really affect your body's ability to work well and to think clearly. Wow. And so um, it can affect many, many different aspects. And so I think that's something that we need to take into account. Absolutely. So our diet or even the, or lack thereof can impact not only our intelligence, but our kids, right. their, um, whether they get sick or how they respond to sickness. Absolutely, and I think we've seen that with COVID, that yes. vitamin D deficiency is a key, pre, key predisposing factor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we know with a seasonal flu, that every year with the flu, the, again, the key predisposing factor is low vitamin D. So if your kids are getting enough vitamin D, they're much less likely mm -hmm. to get ill. Now, people uh, that are darker skinned have trouble processing that. We're gonna talk about that in the next segment. Mm -hmm. So since I think we're about to wrap it up, um, yes. I think some people might want to know where they can get more information. Absolutely. So we're going to have this video and clips and information related to the books that, was, that were referenced at our website, muskeganhealth.net. So please visit us. Um, it's going to be there quite a while. And we hope to follow up, and we will follow up, with additional series. So thank you so much, Christina Parks. Right, I wanted to just touch and, on this. Yes, okay. please, please. So um, this segment, this ancient wisdom segment, is really um, based off the work of Weston Price, and they for found a, um, formed a foundation called the Weston A. Price Foundation. Mm -hmm. And so um, this book, Nourishing Traditions, it was um, put out by the Weston um, uh, Price Foundation, and they also public, keep publishing his book, but they're actually local chapters. So there's a local chapter called Nourishing the Lakeshore, oh. and we're going to have a little uh, PowerPoint where you can kind of review this information because there's a lot of information and yes. there'll be bulleted points on right. there. It will also have where you can reach out because the Weston Price uh, Foundation really does a lot of research on how much vitamin D is in this food and that mm -hmm. food and which is better for me and right. which is more bioavailable for my body because there's a lot of questions as we sort of relearn this information yes. that we didn't know. Absolutely. And so they're there to help us relearn it and figure out what's the, what's the best source for finding this in your local community. Great. And so um, we'll have that information on our website as well. Great, looking forward to it. Thank, thank you for joining us and thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you.